Thank you guys. We have special guests with us today. So we have cut our worship time a little bit short. Uh, if you are a guest today and you filled out a visitor card, you could have put it in the offering bag when it came by. But if you didn't, we would love for you to take it by our welcome card, our welcome booth. It's on the front porch of the church. As you leave today, just stop by, drop it off there. They have a gift for you. They'd love to share with you. And if you need a Bible, they've got a Bible they would love to give to you. And we've got new ones, so the print's a little bigger. You can actually read them now. Uh, at least I can now read them. But uh, anyway. We'd love to know of your presence here today. We promise we'll never beat on your door or pester you on the phone, but through the mail, we will send you information. We hope we'll answer most of your questions about New Hope. I want to introduce to you a lifetime friend of mine, if you don't know him already, Mike Cousineau. Mike, come on up, please. <clears throat> The Cousineau family has been coming to the church that I have been a part of for 50 years. When his mom and dad decided to become missionaries to the Ivory Coast of Africa, they came to the church my dad was pastoring. And so for as long, really, as I can remember missionary work, there have always been a Cousineau involved in our lives. Mike and I are just about the same age. <laughs> what do you have that I don't have? I just found this out in the last service. I have what a lot of you have. <clears throat> a Medicare card. <laughs> yeah, just found that out last service. I don't have mine yet, all right? January. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, Mike's parents were missionaries in the Ivory Coast. And Mike, how, uh, what year was the first year that as a teenager you set foot in Ivory Coast? That would be 1969. Can you guys do the math? How many years ago was that? A lot. <laughs> A lot. <laughs> uh, you failed math, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. That's how many? 50 years ago. That's pretty significant, isn't it? 50 years of ministry in the continent of Africa, a little place called Ivory Coast. Uh, did anybody in Ivory Coast remember that it's been 50 years? They have. In fact, next Sunday, I will be standing in a pulpit in the village where my parents took the gospel and opened up an entire region of the country for the gospel. And the significant thing for me is there was a village about five miles out of our village called Paradis, which in English is paradise. That village for 49 years and a half has been closed to the gospel. And about over the last six months, the darkness has been shattered and the village is open to the gospel and the chief of the village has actually allocated some land to build a worship center or a church. That's significant. <laughs> 49 and a half years of bombarding, bombarding, and praying and praying. And the neat thing is, is that it moved from missionary work to national work because of the leadership that we've had the privilege of training through the years. Uh, Mike, your parents were missionaries, brought the gospel to a region that had never heard the gospel before. Um, you uh, finished high school and you came back to college and you, uh, you came back to Bible college with a sense of purpose of what the next step in your life would be. Uh, you also met Deline and Deline will be here for our next service mm -hmm. and uh, she shared that same passion and purpose that you wanted. But uh, tell our congregation what your desire was when you went back to Africa to minister in the same areas where your parents did? When I was a teenager, I would go when I was home on break from school with my father to the villages to evangelize. And he would be there an hour or two and then leave and then go to the next village. But when he left, there was no more teaching. There was no one there that knew the scripture that could teach the Bible. And so as an 18-year-old young man, one night I was walking on a pathway in front of our house, begging God, pleading with him, please show me 
what you want me to do with my life. And very clearly, he spoke to my spirit and tells me that I want you to return to this very country. And I want you to be involved in training the Ivorian people to become pastors so that they themselves can take the gospel out. And it's been my privilege. Duleen and I have, we left the United States in 1979. So that would be 40 years that we've had the privilege of ministering there off and on, mostly on, you know, when we come back to the States. And seven years after we arrived there is when we had co-founded and built the Bible training center, the pastoral training center. It took seven years, the magic number, but we were the newest kids on the block. And there were older missionaries there. And, you know, I'm pretty energetic and focused and visionary, and sometimes that can be challenging for some people. And so I think God allowed us to go seven years as we continue to work and and mentor young people. And let me just say one thing about the young that young people. In August, I was back in the country and an Ivorian man came downstairs from a guest house I was staying at and he came up to me and he said, "Pastor Cousino." I said, "Yes, that's me." He said, "You probably don't know me, but I know you. When I was in high school, I attended your youth center, and I found Jesus. And I have walked with Jesus since then. I had the privilege of going to France for my education, and I became an engineer. And today I work in France as an engineer. But I heard that you have a school. And I want to send my son from France to your school in Tonda. And he said, there's a lot more of me out there that you don't know about, that you touch their lives. So, you know, that just warms your heart. Warms mine. Well, what it is is 50 years of investing, and sometimes you don't think there's results. And you don't hear about those results for decades. And now he's finding out that young people who found Jesus in his early days of ministry there are now sending their teenage children back to that area in order to receive the gospel and to prepare them for their futures. Um, So... You got the Bible Institute going. You've now started training pastors. Uh, That institute is still functional today. Is that correct? It is functional. We started in 1987. And from day one, my colleague and I, our goal was to work ourselves out of a job. And were you successful at that? We were successful because it is totally 100% under Ivorian leadership. And they continue to train pastors. Now, and along with training pastors, that organization and 1040i, which we'll talk more about in just a moment, uh, you all have launched in recent years a church planting movement. So using many of those who've gotten some training at the Institute with a real focus of taking the gospel into the other regions of the Ivory Coast. Uh, How long has that church planting movement been going on and how many churches have you planted? That movement has been going on about five or six years. And I want to focus on one guy, one church planter in the last two years and nine months has helped to bring 637 people to Christ. Two years, nine months, he's been instrumental in planting 11 churches. So we have 15 church planters in our program, and they've planted close to 100 churches. And each church planter, by the way, their goal each year is to plant between two and four new churches each year. So we have a movement underway. Yeah. And all these are Ivorians. All the church planters are Ivorians. They are all... So... 
I didn't ask this question, and I don't know that you could even give me a close answer right now, but for 30 years of missionary work of Americans in the country, were there 20 churches planted? Yes. Okay. So in 30 years, you probably had about 20 churches planted because it's Americans trying to do a work in another country, but by teaching and training the Ivorians, they were able to go to their own people, be far more effective than we can. We take the gospel, but then we turn it over to them, and that's what you've done, and that's one of the things that I loved about the ministry that Mike has done. So you, you worked yourself out of a job, but God moved upon your heart to start 1040i. Tell them what 1040i is. 1040i is, of course, a nonprofit organization, and it actually means the 1040 initiative. And when I was looking for the name, I was asking God, show me. Please show me. I'm begging, I'm pleading. And he drops that name on my heart, the 1040 initiative, which actually defines an area of the world 10 and 40 degrees north of the equator, spanning across the eastern hemisphere, across Africa, into Asia. And therein lies the majority of the world's population, the poorest of the poor, and the most needy for the gospel. And therein came the name The 1040 Initiative. So... 1040 is engaged in helping villages and communities with water because we learn a lesson from Jesus who said, offer a cup of water. Mm -hmm. And so water is a great need, all right, that they have in that part of the world. And so you assist with the needs of water. You also understand that education is a critical component for future success. You started the institute so that they could learn the Bible, but you realize if we can teach children to read and to get an education, that they are going to be better prepared for the future. Future. You're also engaged in church planting. You're also engaged in medical. And in fact, the medical is kind of the big component that you all go and do the surgeries and the medical treatment in the month of February. And that's at the invitation of those Avorians. And so when the Americans come, we're not coming as know-it-alls, but we're coming as caregivers at the request of the nationals there in the Ivory Coast. And it gives credibility to the ministry of those churches and those pastors that exist and in their future church plants. So uh, that brings us up though one of your big projects now. Uh, let me back up quickly. Several years ago when we got engaged with them, uh, there was a lady who left Abidjan, the big metropolitan city. She walked under the direction of God into the bush of Ivory Coast and found a little village that was really forgotten. And that was where God told her, you need to invest your life. And so she went there as a teacher. There have been children who never had a chance at education before that now have a good education. Uh, orphans have come from all over that part of the country uh, to be rescued, and they live with her, and we have built two dormitories. We have built an eating area, dining hall area. We have built a library with iPads, and uh, they decided to rename their part of the village New Hope Village. And uh, so we've been engaged there for now about five years. That list over there of names we've done for the last four, we're going to do for at least two more years this year and next year. These are kids who went through elementary school with Madame Elise uh, at the village of all of a sudden my brain went dead. Neonan, the Neonan village. Uh, and these were kids who every one of them passed the exam to go to junior high and high school. Uh, only a small percentage in the whole country passed that exam. All of her students passed the first year they took it. And so we accepted the challenge to give them a chance to get a high school education. And so there are 30 students there that we need to sponsor for another year. It's $585, all right? That feeds them, clothes them, pays for their educational needs for an entire year. Wouldn't you like to do that with your teenagers? And medical needs, all right? So, if you would like to sponsor or your small group would like to sponsor a student for the next year, just take a pen and put your name on one of them. Please notice some of them already have a name assigned to them. Their sponsors have already picked them up. Uh, and you can then get that sponsorship in by the end of the year. Now, that was, that was Neonan. 
They've also built an elementary school, state-of-the-art elementary school in the city of Tonda, much bigger area. It's not a village. It is a town, all right? A significant community in that part of Ivory Coast. Then a few years, two years ago, you shared with us the idea that you needed to do a junior high. And last year, we committed over $100,000 to help you do that. Three-year project. We said, yes, we have a project of our own to build over there. And I hate to say this, but I got a letter from the county. There is a good possibility we will break ground the week before Easter. I mean, Thanksgiving. Excuse me. That's even better. Yeah, Thanksgiving. It's... I mean, it's there. Just one last signature and it's done, all right? And we'll be able to break ground. But we said we will not focus our attention only on ourselves. And so this is a project that we've taken. And last year, you gave about a third of it. And we're looking for that again this year. But can you tell me, where are you in the project at Tonda with the junior high? Let me tell you, it's a God thing. Because I think we have a a picture. We uh, started the middle school campus a year ago, June, and in 14 months, we were able to build the building right there. Hold on. That's not a rendering. That's finished. That is finished. And 14 months, guys, while we were getting permits. <laughs> and the significant thing about this building is it's all made out of concrete except for the roof. Every Brick was made one at a time on the ground. Every piece of concrete that was mixed to pour the the floor mixed on the ground and hoisted up in buckets. So that is a, a significant uh, progress. And you see the the classroom with the windows. It's the only classroom with the windows because it is air conditioned. And it is the electronic library and computer laboratory. And right beside it, if you will see something... Next picture. Something shiny up there on those windows. Right up there, there's another picture. And it has New Hope Community Church's name on it. That is one of the classrooms that you're focusing on. Not that one. That's one of the classrooms that you're focusing on. Not that one. You've also focused on two science that laboratories. One. So that that's that's it. It's a state of the art for this area. It's the only school in the area that has a computer lab and a library. It's the only Christian school in the region. And I am convinced that in order to change the direction, the trajectory of a country, it will come from teaching children and teaching them Christian values and teaching them about God. And so that's what we're doing. And this will continue to impact the Ivory Coast for many generations to come when I'm pushing flowers. And that young man who approached you the other day and said he was sending his son to school, is he there? He's here. And I I saw him in September. I I went up there for 24 hours, and it was on a Saturday. And uh, all of the junior high boys, we, we have a small boarding program, and there were clothes hanging everywhere. You know, on the line, on the wall, to dry. And so I went up to him, and his name is Jonathan. I said, Jonathan, how are you enjoying it here? He said, I really am. I said, well, what about washing clothes? Have you ever washed clothes yourself? He said, never. You know, he comes from France now. And a great experience. His father wanted him to get also back to his roots. And just a, a delightful young man. All right, and then moving right along on this, so bring us, show us some other pictures. Pop another one up, and we'll give Mike a, uh, a brief moment or two. Okay, this, this is a is classroom inside the computer lab and, and library. They're holding, actually, because the student body is pretty slim this year. They're holding chapel. 
This is their chapel service there. It's because you just finished the building about two weeks before it was time to start school. So exactly. So we didn't have time to recruit. Expecting an avalanche next year. All right, next picture. Hello? <laughs> Slow. Okay, this is the uh, canteen where it will serve <laughs> also as a chapel. It will serve as student hangout and uh, food. We were able to do this also in this 14-month period. And then we Next. were able to build an administration building. And then we concluded the campus with building a multi-purpose sports court. There should be a picture of that. pictures of that. Um, that, that serves there we as, go. That serves as handball, basketball, and indoor soccer. So all of this... What I shared in the first service, you remember the little song that we sang as a kids? It says, little as much, much when God is if in God it. is in it. And God absolutely helped us to be the very best stewards that we could possibly be and stretch it and build this middle school campus. So we're, our next phase will be the high school building, similar to that middle school building. So we need to engage in our part this year, all right? We took care of a third of it last year. We need to get another third or more in it this year. You know what? If we pay it off this year, I think Mike would say, okay. See, they built first. It's finished. So we got to catch up. So we're going to have an offering at the end. Take those little cards, get them filled out and get ready. And then if yours is just a pledge and you want to take care of it by the end of the year, terrific. Indicate that on the card. If you want to put cash or a check in today, make them to New Hope. We send one check to them. Um, how many of you would like, well, some of you, 23, let me get my notes back here so I don't speak uh, foolishly. Uh, 23 people from New Hope over the last 10 years have been on a mission trip to Ivory Coast, Africa. You saw a few of them in the pictures as you were arriving today. Um, Lindsay Eccles is the one who started this, and she flew out to Maui today. But, but she's been on five trips. I went on my first trip in 2013, and I've been on seven trips. Katie Kolb went on a trip. Steve and Lee Childress went on four trips together. Joe Fish, Shelly has been on two trips. David Dunlap went on one. Robin Butter, Robin, stay. If I call your name, stand up. Remain standing for just a moment. Shelly, Stan, Robin, Stan. Uh, Terry Ritchie, which was her sister-in-law, was able to go. Fawn Boss was in the last service. Steve and Kim Drake. Uh, David and Kathy Higley. Uh, they went. Dr. Acusia, who's a friend of uh, Shelly's, went with us. Tom Riska, who's having hip replacement. Uh, Candace Sisko. I don't think she's in this service next one, usually. Uh, Mark Adams. He's here, back there in the back. He's been on two trips. Brandon Best, Akira Cathcart, who is in college, Teresa Hutchinson, Linda Bropes was in our 8 o'clock service. That's 23 people totaling 41 trips we've made. Nobody, you may be seated. Thanks, guys. If you want to sit down, that's great too, Mike. Thank you very, very much. So 2020 is a break year for us, but we hope to break our record in 2021. The most we've ever had going one year were 12. We would love to take 15 to maybe 20 of you in 2021. The trip is the first two weeks of February. That trip has several components to it. It's a medical trip. There are surgeons who go and they do incredible surgeries. There are nurses who assist them. Uh, there are people who just provide care for recovery afterwards. So there's a medical component. There is also a Kids Fest component. Shelly uh, is the one who got that started a few years years ago, and they're continuing to do, it's like Vacation Bible School, uh, but it's done in one or two villages near, near where Duropo is. It's just exciting to see what you can do with kids in three or four days. Uh, there is construction projects that are going to be involved, as well as educational needs. So um, if you have an interest in going on a trip in 2021, you've got a lot of time to prepare for this one. Tonight at 5.30, come meet us in the bridge probably for an hour, hour and 15 minutes. We're going to have pizza available. If you want to come... 
bring a, bring a salad or a jello if you'd like, all right, to go along with a pizza or some fresh fruit. Uh, we'll also have beverages available for you. So uh, I know I just threw it out at you. You didn't know anything about that. But how many of you think, and this is for alumni or people interested in going on a trip, alumni get a chance to visit with Mike a little more, or you'd like more information, maybe God's prompting you, hey, maybe I'd like to do a trip to Africa. How many of you think you'll come back tonight? Raise your hand. I want to have enough pizzas. I got one. I had eight in the eight o'clock service. You think about it. Up two, three. All right, all right. I got got a couple more. Uh, all right. So we're gonna we're gonna be there tonight. I know some of our uh, possibly our high school kids are coming as well. So uh, come out, check us out tonight, and um, we'll answer those questions. Now you're gonna get a 12 minute sermon. You don't think I can do it, do you? <laughs> I did an eight o'clock service, didn't I, Mike? 12 minutes. Put your, ear, put your tinny runners on your ears, all right? Uh, and this will tie into the offering at the end. There was a TV show that many of us enjoyed if we watched TV in the 70s and the 80s. It was a sitcom called The Jeffersons. That show featured an African-American family who became wealthy and they moved out of a rundown area in Queens to a luxury apartment in Manhattan. The theme song for that show was rather catchy and it included the words, moving on up. And it went kind of like this. Well, we're moving on up to the east side, to deluxe apartment in the sky, moving on up to the east side. We finally got a piece of the pie. Whenever we speak of advancement or promotion, we tend to think of it as upward motion. Climbing the ladder, breaking that glass ceiling, getting on top of the heap, upgrading, elevating. But nothing says it better for me than those three words, moving on up. You see, up is the direction everybody wants to go. For the path upward seems to be the path to fame and to fortune, to honor and to glory. But it isn't interesting that many of the earth's most precious substances like gold, diamonds, can only be acquired by digging down deep. And the person who is willing to go very low can become very wealthy. Engineers also understand that if you want to raise a tall building, first they need to go low and lay a deep foundation. The same is true about spiritual promotion. The way up is down. Jesus said, he who humbles himself will be exalted. The low path of humility is the only way to promotion with God. D.L. Moody, the founder of Moody Bible Institute, may have said it best when he said, the beginning of greatness is to be little. The increase of greatness is to be less. And the perfection of greatness is to make yourself nothing. This is the message that Paul communicated to the Philippians. That little book we've been looking at for the last two months. In chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, Paul talks about this very principle. The study is about those qualities that every Christian should and needs to develop in their life. Why is it important for us to have such a heart as Paul describes? It's because the condition of the heart the condition of your heart, the condition of my heart, it determines who we are. Here is what the wisest man who ever lived said about the subject in Proverbs 4.23, above all else. When you hear that, what does that mean? Above all else. It means it's pretty important, doesn't it? In fact, what it literally means is there's nothing more important. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. And how we relate to others comes out of our heart. Luke 6.45 says, For out of the overflow of the heart is how one speaks to others. Is yours a wellspring of kindness or frustration? Out of the wellspring of the heart is how we treat others. Today we're going to be looking at having a heart of a servant, which Jesus said should be our overall desire if we're interested in moving on up through the kingdom of God. You see, Matthew 20, 26 says, whoever desires to become great among you, Jesus speaking himself, says, let him be a servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be a slave, just as the Son of Man came to be served didn't come to be served, but rather to serve others, to give his life a ransom for many. Listen to what Paul said to this church at Philippi. 
let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, for God he was, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made of himself no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. From this passage, there are three perspectives of a servant heart that I can find. Number one, it's a humble heart made himself of no reputation. This word reputation literally means to pour oneself out. And that is exactly what Jesus did. He emptied himself from being recognized as who he truly was, God, and instead he took upon himself the form of a slave. That's what a bondservant does. He or she relinquishes their rights to themselves in order to serve their master. We see this literally played out for us when Jesus picked up a basin of water at the last Passover meal and then he went to each of his 12 disciples and he washed their feet. The scripture says he poured water in a basin and he took a towel and he washed their feet and he dried them off and then he said, I've given you an example that what you've seen me do to you, you ought to do to each other. Right before his description of Jesus' humility as a servant, in this letter, Paul tells us that you and I are to be humble as well in our humility of considering others. In verses 3 and 4, Paul said, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of your mind, let each of you esteem others better than themselves. Let each of you look not only to your interests, but also what's for the best in others. The Apostle Peter emphasizes this same principle in chapter 5, verse 5 of 1 Peter, where he says, all of you be submissive to one another, be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. We need to get the focus off ourselves and put it upon Christ, and when we do that, we'll start being not only humble, but more obedient. And that leads me to the second aspect of a servant's heart. A servant's heart is an obedient heart. You see, it's hard to be obedient if we're not humble. Order's important. Humility comes before obedience. You you see, if I'm not humble and somebody tells me to do something, what's my reaction going to be? I don't have to do that. You're not my mommy. Humility comes leads to obedience. That's what the scripture says. Verse 8, he humbled himself and became obedient to death. Someone with a servant's heart obeys God, not out of convenience, but out of conviction. Many people will serve God only if it's convenient for them and helpful for them, but a true servant will serve God from conviction and then will choose to obey even when it gives them no personal value. But it does give you kingdom value. 1 Corinthians 4, 2, Paul said, it is required of stewards that you be found faithful. Such conviction and obedience will take courage at times because we take our directions from the scripture and to obey scripture in this world and in this culture particularly, others will look at you and say, what are you doing? And they'll do their best to intimidate you and you can say, this is what God tells me to do and it requires courage in order to do that. You and I need to learn the lesson of that well-known theologian by the name of John Wayne who said very succinctly, courage is being scared to death but saddling up anyway. Jesus was obedient to God's calling all the way to the death of the cross. When it doesn't make sense in our own understanding or in the understanding of our culture, we need to stand on God's word. And and this leads me to the last aspect we find in these verses of a servant's heart. And that is, it's a sacrificial heart. It's humble, it's obedient, and through obedience we will become sacrificial. It might be impossible to be sacrificial without first being humble and obedient. Jesus sacrificed it all when he left heaven and came to earth, and he gave his life for every one of us. A servant will put others before themselves, relinquishing rights in order to serve. Mother Teresa told a story how one of her sisters had spent an entire day bathing the wounds of a dying beggar. She said that in reality, the nun had been bathing the wounds of Jesus himself. She said that Jesus tests the loves of his followers by hiding in grotesque disguises to see if we can still see him through them. 
the heart of a servant recognizes that by serving others, even those who seem to be unlovely, we are serving Christ. Jesus said, in as much as you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Jesus makes this idea of sacrifice very clear in Luke chapter 9 when he says, if anybody desires to come after me, let him deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. If you've been around here very long and you've heard me preach on that passage, you know that taking up the cross doesn't mean living a life of inconvenience. It means dying to yourself. To have a servant's heart, it's going to cost to have a servant's heart goes against everything we're taught. It conflicts with our self-centeredness and our personal desires. But in the end, there is a reward waiting for that kind of heart. The reward of a servant's heart is that God, not man, will move us on up. Philippians 2, 9 and 11 says, God also has highly exalted Christ, the one who humbled himself to the death on a cross. God the Father has exalted him and given him a name above every name that in the name of Jesus every knee would bow. Greatness comes from humility of being a servant of the Most High God. Paul said in Colossians 3, whatever you do, do it heartily to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you'll receive the reward of your inheritance because you served him. The ultimate reward for having a servant's heart is having the joy of the Lord and the reward of heaven. Once this life is over and hearing Jesus say at our entrance into heaven, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. When we give our heart to Christ, he returns the favor. Ezekiel 36 says, I will give you a new heart and I'll put a new spirit in you. You don't like the old spirit that's governed your life? <laughs> then die to yourself and receive by grace this new heart that God wants to give to every one of us. Tara Storch understands this miracle as much as anybody can. It was in the spring of 2010, and a skiing accident took the life of her 13-year-old daughter, Taylor. What followed for Tara and her husband, Todd, was every patient's worst nightmare. A funeral, a burial, a flood of questions and tears. They decided to donate their daughter's organs to needy patients. Few people needed a heart more than a woman named Patricia Winters. Her heart had begun to fail five years earlier, leaving her too weak to do much more than just sleep. Taylor's heart would give Patricia a fresh start in life. Tara had only one request regarding her daughter's heart. She wanted to hear it beat one more time. She and Todd got on a plane in Dallas, Texas and flew to Phoenix, Arizona, where Patricia lived. These two women embraced for a long time at the entryway of Patricia's home. And then Patricia offered Tara and Todd a stethoscope. And she placed it over her chest. And while they listened to the healthy rhythm of that heart, whose heart did Tara and Todd hear? They heard the beating heart of their own child. And when God hears our heart, does he not want to hear the heart of his son beating in you and in me? As Paul said, it is no longer I who live but it's Christ who lives in me. The apostle sensed within himself not just the philosophy of God, not just the ideals or the influence of Christ, but Paul sensed the living presence, the beating heart of the Son of God himself. Christ moved in, and he still does today. When grace happened, Christ enters our hearts. Christ in us, the hope of glory, Paul wrote in Colossians 1. No other religion or philosophy makes such a claim. No other movement implies the living presence of its founder in his followers. Muhammad does not indwell Muslims. Buddha does not inhabit Buddhists. L. Ron Hubbard does not live in Scientologists. Influence 
instruction, enticement, maybe. But occupy? No one but Jesus. And the Christian is a person in whom Christ is happening and he will not only move in, but he will move us up if we are willing to dig down deep. What kind of heart do you have? Is it one filled with humility? Is it one filled with obedience? Is it one filled with sacrifice? If you're here and you don't know Christ, you can have that kind of heart beginning today. It's a simple prayer. God, I don't have that kind of heart and I want one. He'll say, great, let me move in. And if you let me move in, I'll move you up. When we die, don't we all want to go up? I got to be honest, I've never had one person say, I want to go down. Not one person have I had ever say, Tim, I want to go to hell. But God wants to move us up. Now, Sacrifice is also in our giving. You've heard the challenge of Mike. You've heard our commitment to this project. And so our ushers are going to come forward and they're going to wait on us as, as we receive another offering. You may not be able to give today because you didn't come prepared for that, but you have a card and you can just write a pledge on it. Tim, I'm going to give $1,000 between the end of now and the end of the year. Tim, I'm going to give $100. Whatever it is, just write it right on there. Drop that, your check or your cash in the offering that it comes by. Ushers, come on forward. Don't be bashful. Okay? All right. Would you join with me as we give thanks for this offering? And then I got a question for you before anybody gets up and leaves. Our Father in heaven, thank you for being challenged and encouraged today by what you're doing in other parts of the world. Thank you for the passion and the purpose that you've put in the heart of Mike Cousineau and his team. And thank you, Father, that that passion and that purpose lines up with the passion and the purpose that we find in Scripture, which is the call of the church to go into the uttermost parts of the world and share the gospel, to not only share the message in Jerusalem, which would be Clovis, and Judea, which would be California, and Judea, which would be the United States, and the uttermost parts of the earth, which would be places like the Ivory Coast of Africa. Thank you for enabling us and giving us the privilege of being engaged in not just a once-and-done thing in another part of the world, but in something that will last for decades to come. Thank you, Father, for what you've planned and what you've purposed this day. In Christ's name we pray, amen and amen. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if you would wait on us, that would be absolutely terrific. If you guys wouldn't mind, if you were able to, throw that video that was scrolling at the beginning of the service, if you would throw that up on the screen as the offering is being taken. Some of you have had a chance to think now during the last, you see, that was a 12 and a half minute sermon. All right, all right. And that included the prayer, actually. Um, don't expect it next Sunday. Uh, but you had a chance to think about whether you'd like to come back and learn more about a mission trip tonight. Do I have any other takers? You want to come back about 5.30 this evening? Pizza's on us, all right? Beverage is on us. Anybody else want to come? I've, uh... All right, one more. All right, terrific, good. Uh, all right, those of you at the front half, the, the offering bag has already been by. You may get up and head out that door. All right? God bless you. Have a great day. As soon as uh, the offering bag comes down your aisle, you are dismissed. God bless you. Thank you for being here.